truly, 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 methinks thou dost protest too much. Whether you want to believe or not, you do. We all do. Even God's own called and chosen prophets are sometimes guilty of the same sinful behaviors of all fallen human beings. Of all the prophets in Holy Scripture, Jonah has the most in common with us. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh to proclaim God's impending wrath and the destruction of their city. Jonah, knowing what invariably happens to prophets, they usually die, he turns tail and he, he runs as far in the opposite direction as he can, even catching a ship so he can fail, sail to the farthest ends of the earth, farther and farther away from God, or so he thinks. Just like us, though, he's trying to hide from God. He's trying to avoid the task that God has called him to. Just like us, Jonah resists. He kicks against the goads, pushing as hard as he can against the divine will of our Father in heaven. Foolish humans. We are so foolish. If God can create the whole universe and all that has been or ever will be in existence with a simple flick of his finger, do you truly think that you can fight against him? Do you think that you are perhaps more powerful than God? Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you, says the Lord in the book of Job to us foolish men. But you cannot run. You cannot hide. Just as Jonah discovered, our Father will seek and will find us to fulfill his own purposes according to his good and gracious will. We can try and run from God. Indeed, we see people doing it all the time. We flee his love. We flee his comfort, preferring to try and work things out by ourselves rather than turning our burdens over to Christ Jesus. We hear his truth, and it burns our ears, his words conflicting with what we want to hear, making us realize that though we may not like it, it's necessary for our very being and for our salvation. We see his son stretched out upon the cross, and we, in the world's eyes, we, we see an abomination, a horrific crime against an innocent man, and we know it should be us instead hanging there, and we find it accusing, and we find it offensive to our eyes. So we turn, we turn and we flee. We shut tight our eyes and try and drown out God's own voice calling us to do his harvest work. Just as we pained him in his mercy, his goodness is painful to us in our hardened hearts. Okay, so perhaps you've, you've now stopped running. You've paused, you're out of breath, you're winded, and now you decide to listen to what God is calling you to do. Just like Jonah, you are now literally vomited up out of the grave, redeemed and alive, a living witness called to announce God's good news of the kingdom in Christ, speaking the forgiveness of God and his love for his fallen creation. Both you and Jonah, you know exactly what's going to happen. You'll go through the city, proclaiming and announcing that in 40 days, the city will be overturned, given to God's wrath. And like Jonah, you even say to yourself, why these people? They're so sinful. It's going to be just like Sodom and Gomorrah when he's done. Just you wait and see. These people are such impenitent sinners. Maybe because of that, your efforts will be half-hearted. You don't really care without energy or zeal. Simply going through the motions so God will stop his nagging and let you be. Does this sound familiar? If it doesn't, it really, really should. Really, isn't this our attitude most of the time when we find ourselves in a position or place to testify to God's power in Christ? You might ask yourselves, how many times do we throw our hands into the air when God's word doesn't effect a visible and immediate change on the hearts of those around us? Do we cast, perhaps, before swine those who would otherwise be pearls of faith if we would only make a second third, or even fourth effort at reaching out in truth and love. How many souls, how many people might have experienced the renewing power of Christ had we simply turned back and spoken to them one more time? 
Oh, if these questions don't bother you, they should. For how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So I pose a question to you today. Ask yourself this. Just how beautiful are your feet today? Maybe you are one of those who answers God's call to witness, proclaim, and speak God's word. Maybe you do it effectively. Bring many people to Jesus through your speaking his promise of forgiveness and eternal life. Ask yourself now, who gets the credit? In today's Old Testament reading, just as he was in the belly of the fish, Jonah expects that it will take three days, just three days of intense preaching to fulfill God's will for the Ninevites and that God will ultimately ultimately destroy the city. After all, they're evil Gentiles who will most assuredly be wiped from the face of the earth. But you see, it's not our plans. God gets what God wants, not what Jonah wants. God wants Jonah to preach. God wants Jonah to proclaim, even if it seems a moot point to Jonah. Jonah's attitude is so much like ours that at times it's not even funny. We see people around us in the depth of sin and depravity, steeped in sick and sin, perhaps even still running from God. We, we who were once dead in our own trespasses, we deem them to be undeserving of God's mercy. So just like Jonah, we, we wring our hands, anticipating the downfall of those we see as truly sinful, forgetting that we ourselves were once enemies of God as well. We speak God's word of comfort, all the while smugly thinking, you'll get what's coming to you soon enough. Then it happens. Then it happens. God, according to his wisdom, and not ours by any means, affects the change in the hearts of those once doomed to destruction. They repent. They're truly sorrowful for their sins, and in his mercy for the sake of Christ, he lifts them up out of the grave and blesses them. And we who were once judge, jury, and executioner of our fellow sinners, we see the wonders that God has wrought in them, and we shout, foul, foul. You see, because like Jonah, we see God's mercy working in the hearts of men, and we don't like it. They should have been destroyed. They're cursed after all. They're evil sinners. They're Guess what? Just like you and I. Who are we to tell God who is worthy of salvation? As our Father in Heaven tells us in the book of Job, who are we to question Him saying, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like His? Well, I tell you, unless you do have an arm or a voice like God's, it would be well to let God be God and not tell him how to be creator, redeemer, and judge of the universe. Such foolish mortals are we, laying claim to that which is God's alone. It's not our words, it's not our words at all that effect a change upon a sinful man's heart. It's not our actions which take that which was once dead and make it alive again. And despite what, despite what we may think and reason, God's almighty and God's all-powerful word does not take three days to raise new that which was filled with the stench of death. Like the Ninevites, God's holy word is immediate in its changing of hearts of stone into new hearts, hearts that can truly love God and man and can claim Jesus as Lord and King. Only when we allow the full reign of God's word only when we get out of the way of the way the truth and the life can we experience joy fully and completely in Christ Jesus you see God calls us he calls each and every one of us to be lights upon a hill and to cast that light out upon this world our father doesn't tell us who will experience the life-changing power of his word he doesn't tell us who will harden their hearts to his son and so be condemned. 
we aren't called to keep a body count, if you will, of souls saved. We don't make chalk marks up on the wall as only God knows the inner thoughts and desires of all men. He simply calls us to speak Christ crucified in all of his foolishness, in all of his folly, in all of his offense, in all of his obscenity. He calls us to simply speak this and speak it simply so that hurting spirits may know of their release from sin, death, and the grave. He calls you, each and every one of you, dear brothers and sisters, that you should take great joy in what he has done and what he has in store for you. And do not worry about what you will say or to whom you will say it, because our Lord has promised us in his own word that on my account you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So let God be God and do not flee, do not run, but answer in humble joy to the one who calls you, for he is faithful and he is true, and he will bring to fruition what he has promised in you to the glory of his holy name. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ, that joy which surpasses all understanding, who together in the love of the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit, strengthen us all in the one true faith to life everlasting. Amen.